uh, let's start our talk today. Our speaker today is a Professor Sandra Black. He's a professor at Columbia University now and is also an editor at a Journal of Labor Economics. We have 45 minutes today and Sandy just told me that she needs a lot of time. So I guess I'll just uh, give the time to her and maybe uh, at around like 35 to 40 minutes, we will start to uh, take uh, questions from the floor. And so the listener, you can uh, write down your, your questions on the chat room and then later she can uh, pick up pick up questions. Okay, Cindy, the time is yours. <laughs> Great, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, it's really an honor. Uh, it's at, it's uh, Thursday night here, so it's the time difference is really rough <laughs> between uh, here and China. I wish I was there in person, um, and hopefully you'll invite me some other time um, because I've been to Shanghai, but not Beijing, and I would love, love to go. But in the meantime, um, I want to talk today about wealth, uh, and I'm going to focus on a couple of papers that I worked on and I'm currently working on and and also try to put them in the context of kind of the literature as a whole. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of attention on wealth and wealth inequality um, in the United States. This kind of documents what's been going on. So this is the um, share of wealth held by the top 10%. And you can see there was kind of a big, uh, it was really high in the 1920s and earlier. Uh, there was a big decline uh, through the 1980s. And then since the 1990s, it's been increasing by a lot. So this is an example of the United States, but we see this in a lot of other countries where we see uh, wealth inequality increasing and particularly at the top. So this pattern is even more extreme uh, when you look at the top 1% or even the top 0.1%, you see the, the, wealth, the share of wealth that they hold is, is really increasing recently. Um, and, uh, this increase in inequality is really troubling when we think about the high persistence in wealth across generations. So we might be less concerned if people kind of randomly were born and some were successful and some weren't, and you know there was some process, but it was it was kind of fair. Um, but what we see is in fact that there's a lot of persistence across generations. So this widening widening inequality is then passed on to the next generation. And um, just as one example, uh, Kerwin Charles and Eric Hurst documented in the US that there was a persistence of about 0.37 uh, when we look at wealth in the United States. So there's really a lot of persistence over time. Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna talk about, as I said, a couple of papers that I've worked on or I am working on. The first is thinking about What's driving this persistence across generations? So why do we see parents' wealth translating into children's wealth? Um, and so I'm gonna focus on a paper that I worked on with co-authors where we think about the difference be between nature versus nurture. So how important is uh, biology and your biological parent component and how much is the environment that your parents give you and the opportunities that they give you once you're born? And so we're gonna try to disentangle those um, without kind of specifically saying what it is about nature or nurture. And then I'm just going to reference briefly, uh, I've made it shorter in the last 15 minutes because I, I want to have time for questions, hopefully. Um, there's really a new literature that's, I think, very exciting that then tries to distinguish different components. So if we have a shock to wealth, what happens to children's outcomes, really trying to get at kind of causal mechanisms behind this. Um, and then at the end of the talk, I want to talk about some brand new work that I've been uh, doing with, again, with co-authors, where we actually take a step back. And this, this was inspired by the work that I've done before, um, but really a step back and think about when you're, when you think about wealth inequality or, you know, the importance of wealth for kids, you know, as they're growing up, what are we actually thinking about? What do we mean? Because wealth is actually a really funny measure. So uh, I hope uh, you'll indulge me with that at the, at the end of the talk. Um, um, so the first thing that I want to address is why wealth is correlated across generations. So as I said, we want to think about the role of nature versus nurture in the intergenerational transmission of wealth. 
Um, and so I like this as an example of what we're thinking about. Uh, Paul Devereaux, who's one of my co-authors in this project, and actually all the projects, um, found this. And this is a famous conversation that never happened. So F. Scott Fitzgerald, who wrote The Great Gatsby, said, the rich are different than you and me. And um, Ernest Hemingway said, yes, they have more money. And so the reason I like this is because F. Scott Fitzgerald has this image of wealthy people as just being inherently different, that they're, they're you know, better or smarter or something. And Hemingway kind of has the opposite perspective is like, yes, they're different, they have more money, but that's really the only difference that we see. And so, um, and so what, what we're thinking about with this nature versus nurture is kind of trying to get at this, you know, are they inherently different types of people or is it just that they're the same people who happen to have more opportunities? And so when we think about nature and nurture, um, what we're thinking about broadly in terms of nature are really pre-birth factors. So um, given there's a large literature, especially recently, about the importance of environment in utero, we're actually going to be including that in the nature component. So there is some environmental component to that, uh, and I'll explain why in a second. But what we're thinking about is anything that's kind of transmitted through genetics, like skills, uh, potentially, or to the extent that attitudes and preferences uh, are, are in genetic, that, that would be picking up the nature part. When we think about environment, it's really everything else. So every opportunity or resource or anything that a parent can actually provide for their child as the child is growing up. So things like investing in their education, in, uh, their, in clubs, giving them help with their career, teaching them about risk and savings and to the extent that that forms their preferences, and then even directly just giving them money, either loaning them money so they can buy a house or just directly giving them money. Um, and in general, it's hard to distinguish these things because the same parents who uh, give birth to you, your biological parents are also the same ones who are raising you. And so you just can't distinguish these two things because they go together. Um, so you might kind of see where we're going with this. We're going to try to separate that uh, by looking at adoptees, uh, where we're essentially breaking the link between biology and environment. And so this is a paper um, that I wrote with Paul Devereaux, Petter Lundberg, and Kaveh Majlesi um, using data from Sweden. And so what we did was use administrative data on wealth from a for a large sample of adoptees and um, as well as own birth children. So we can also look at kids who are born and raised by the same parents. Um, born in Sweden between about 1950 and 1970. Um, and what's important for this sample is that we can observe both the biological and the adoptive parents of the adopted children. And so we can really see which is a better predictor of children's wealth. Is it the biological parents' wealth or the adoptive parents' wealth? Um, and so by doing that, we're able to actually distinguish the role of nature versus nurture in the transmission of wealth. In the second part of the paper, we kind of try to say, okay, what is it about nurture? So we find that environment is really much more important with wealth than nature is. And we say, well, what is it about environment? And so the second part of the paper is really kind of much more suggestive about what could be going on. Um, can we kind of disentangle that a little bit? And so just to give you a little bit of the institutional background, um, uh, adoption is, is a pretty good way of getting, separating nature versus nurture, you know, um, Ideally, from an, you know, an, uh, an evaluation perspective, we'd like kids to be randomly assigned to uh, families, but of course, in real life, we would never actually do that. So um, what we're doing is we're going to have kids who are, you know, almost randomly assigned to adopted families, but the adopted families, as you'll see, look better than families on average, right? Because it's not random, you have to actually get approved to adopt a child. Um, and so what you see is that we, biological parents of who put their children up for adoption look observably worse in terms of education and income and wealth uh, than, than, you know, kids who are raised by their biological parents and adoptive parents actually look better on average. 
Um, and so just to give you an idea of the institution, because it's kind of a cool environment, um, at the time, so I remember this is 1950 to 1970s in Sweden, um, it was anonymous adoption. That just means that the um, parent, adopted parents didn't know who the biological parents were and vice versa. Um, you weren't allowed to have private adoption, so everything happened through the state. And so the state collected information about the, both the biological and the adoptive parents. So um, in order to adopt a baby, you had to be married and at least 25 years old, have appropriate housing, have a father with a steady income and a mother is able to stay home with the child. So again, this is a very select sample. Um, and as a result, the adoptive parents tend to look better on observables than um, regular parents. Um, children weren't placed in their new families at random, but it seems like the things that they were matched on were kind of things like, do they look similar? Because they wanted the families to blend. Um, and in the paper, we spend a lot of time kind of trying to show, even though there's some very small correlations between uh, the wealth of the biological parents and the wealth of the adoptive parents, I think it's 0.07, um, uh, because we can observe both parents, it's really not a pro problem because we can kind of control for these characteristics. Um, but we also do some simulations to say, you know, if this isn't random, like how is that biasing our effects? And basically the answer is not very much at all. Um, and then most children who were adopted were adopted young. So we can't observe your age at adoption, but we know that most of them were adopted within the first year. And if anything, it's going to bias us towards finding a bigger role for birth parents, uh, the biological parents, because um, uh, if they're staying with them for longer. Um, and so I should be clear, I think this is a really cool way of doing this. We were not the first ones to do it. So if you know this literature, you know there was a, a very cool paper uh, by Bjorklund, Lindahl, and Plug um, many years ago where they actually did this looking at education. Um, and so, uh, so we are definitely not the first. We're the first to apply it in this context, but, but you know, there's clearly, we're building on, on other work. Um, so to just give you the empirical specification that we're estimating, uh, it's super simple. It's we're saying the wealth of the child, and here we're going to use the rank, although the results aren't sensitive to kind of different functional form specifications. So the rank uh, of the, the child as a function of the rank of the biological family, the rank in wealth of the uh, adoptive family, a very parsimonious set of controls. So we're just controlling for the year of birth of parents and the year of birth of children and then the gender of the child. So that's all we're including because we're really just trying to get these correlations. And um, the wealth rank is estimated for within the age. So parents of the same age and children of the same age. And they're estimated on the total population. So not just for adoptive kids, um, but the whole population of kids. Um, and so just to think about what we're doing, we're just basically saying, is this beta one bigger or smaller? You know, how does it compare to beta two, which is more predictive uh, of children's wealth? Um, okay. And so just to tell you a little bit about the data, um, one of the nice things is you'll see this paper is on Sweden. The other paper I want to talk about is using Norwegian data. Um, it is not because you know, I do like Sweden and Norway, but, uh, you know, it wasn't that I thought those would be the most interesting countries to look at, but uh, as you probably already know, they just collect really good data. And so what's nice in terms of wealth is that both Norway and Sweden had a wealth tax. Norway actually still has it. Um, Sweden no longer does, but as a result, they have really good high quality data on wealth and these, um, data are reported by the financial institutions themselves. So it's not reported by individuals on how much they have. It's actually just directly reported to Statistics Norway or uh, Statistics Sweden. Um, and so in Sweden, we have 
uh, data between 1999 and 2006. And so what we're for wealth, that was when they had the wealth tax. So what we're going to do is measure the wealth of the parents in 1999 and that of the kids in 2006, because we want the parents to be as young as possible and the kids to be as old as possible. Um, what's interesting when we do uh, in the paper that I won't talk about here is that when we look at different ages, the results really don't change. That this coral, these correlations that I'm going to show you are really consistent across uh, ages. And it's because uh, children's rank in the distribution really doesn't, people's rank doesn't change very much over time. So I think that was kind of interesting. And there's other work that has looked at that. Um, and so we really have great data on all financial assets, um, anything held outside of retirement accounts. Uh, and then we match that to the po population register so we can see all the family relations and things like that. And so, as I said, we're going to focus on Swedish citizens who were born in Sweden between 1950 and 1970 with all uh, parents alive in 1999. So we have to observe your parents in 1999 to know what their wealth was. Um, and we, we restrict most of the time to having at least one parent alive, one adoptive parent alive, if when we're looking at adoptees in 2006. And that's because we really want to abstract from inheritances. So most of the time you can think about these as the effects without inheritances uh, because the parents are still alive. Um, okay. And so here's, it's a really simple uh, paper in terms of, you know, the technical aspect of it. This is just a simple uh, graph of uh, parents' rank in the wealth distribution and uh, child's rank in the wealth distribution. So you can see it's upward sloping. Um, this actually does have a 95% confidence interval, but this is for the sample of biological children who are raised by their biological parents. So this is kind of most people. Um, so we have about 1.2 million kids in this data. So um, even though the confidence intervals are in there, you can see that it's just really precisely estimated because our samples are so big. We have trimmed the top and bottom uh, 5%. And that's because when we don't do that, you see it kind of curving up and curving down here. Um, and so those nonlinearities are kind of well established in the literature. Um, because we're going to be focusing on adoptees, our sample sizes are a lot smaller. And so we really want to focus on the parts where we can best estimate. Um, so here's essentially the results in a visual. Um, so here we're looking at the adopted children, and this is the relationship between the biological parent's rank and the adopted children's uh, rank. And this is the adoptive parent's rank and the, the adopted children's rank. And so this is kind of the, the nature, and, and this one is the nurture. And again, we've trimmed the top and bottom. You can see that the confidence intervals are obviously a lot bigger. We have, you know, about 2,500 adoptees. So it's a big sample of adoptees, but a small sample relative to 1.2 million. Um, the biological parents, we have many fewer at the very top of the distribution. So our confidence intervals are bigger up here than they are down here. And the opposite is true for the adopted parents where we just don't have very many at the bottom of the distribution, but many more at the top. So if you're a visual person, which I am not at all, you would notice that this line is flatter than this line, uh, suggesting that adoptive parents' uh, wealth is more predictive of the children's wealth rank than biological parents. To me, they look pretty equal, um, I guess, uh, but it, so I'm going to show you the regression because that was more useful for me. Um, so this is the results basically from the, what I presented before. So in the paper, we present the results when we don't trim the data and then when we trim the bottom and top 5%. And that's the full sample, not of the adopted sample. So, um, uh, and so what you can see, this is just the simple regression. This is the full sample. So this is where the biological children are raised by the biological parents. Um, so that's just kind of what we normally estimate as the rank correlation is about 0.34. When we trim, uh, it goes down just a little bit to 0.328. Um, 
And then when we look at the adoptees, so our sample sizes are getting much smaller here. Um, uh, what we see is that uh, the biological parents, you know, have an effect of 0.13. Uh, the adoptive parents, it's about 0.23. So it's substantially larger. So that suggests that when the adoptive parents uh, rank goes up by one, on average, the, the child's rank goes up by 0.23 um, versus if the biological parent's rank goes up, it only goes up by 0.13. So it's much bigger, um, uh, suggesting a much stronger role for uh, adoptive parents or environment. One thing that I we did that I thought was cool is we say, okay, so so far I told you we don't let the kids die, the parents die, um, so that we don't have the quests in there or inheritances, because uh, that's obviously going to make things bigger. Um, and so what we do is one test is say, okay, let's add back in the ones whose parents died. Both parents died between 1999 and 2006. So we're only adding about 100 kids in there. Uh, but what we see when we do that, so now we've added in a dummy for whether both parents died and then the interaction between both parents dying and the adoptive parental wealth rank. And what we see is their initial coefficients are very, very similar. So they almost don't change. But then this interaction term saying how much bigger is the effect of adoptive parents' wealth on child's wealth if both parents have died. And you can see it more than doubles. So it's 0.28. And so the total effect is going to be the sum of these two, so about 0.5. And so um, this suggests that once you allow for inheritances, the effect of environment becomes even more important. When we start looking at the mechanisms and pathways, um, what could be driving it? So we know parents' wealth is correlated with a lot of other uh, parents' characteristics like higher education or higher earnings. Um, parents' wealth could have a direct effect on children's education or career by you know, giving them money, which gives them opportunities. Um, or it could be affecting you know, financial behavior, such as how their portfolio or how they save. And so what we try to do in the paper is just look at, do these things seem to be important? And we have no causation here. So it's very speculative. We're just trying to get kind of a back of the envelope. Could these things seem important? And what we find is that parents' education and income doesn't seem to explain very much of the, the, uh, the environmental effect. Um, it does seem like having uh, parents with more wealth um, affects children's income and education. So uh, wealth seems to improve the outcomes of children, not just wealth, but income and education. We find that there does seem to be different investment behavior. So the portfolios that kids have, uh, if they have wealthy uh, adoptive parents is, is, is different. And that seems to actually matter a, a reasonable amount. The savings works in the wrong direction in that if you have wealthy parents, you actually save less, which makes sense if you think of, you know, that's like your insurance plan. So you don't need to save because you have your parents. But overall, we really can't explain more than 25% of the environmental factors. Um, so we don't really know exactly what's going on there. And then uh, at the end of the paper, we just try to put it in context and we say, how does wealth look compared to other outcomes that people have looked at and a few other that we look at? Um, and so this is the biological rank correlation and this is the adoptive parent rank correlation. So anything on this 45 degree line suggests that biological and adoptive parents are equally important. And so um, what we see here is that schooling, and this is consistent with what other work has found, uh, schooling is, is kind of more biological than, uh, more nature than nurture. Um, so biology is more important. Everything related to wealth is actually on the other side of the line, suggesting that nurture or environment is much more important. And you can see that wealth is way up here. And then when we add in inheritances, it's, it gets even bigger. And so, um, so we think this is kind of an important context. There's also some other papers that I think are pretty exciting, trying to look at kind of causal identification of shocks to wealth to see um, how kids 
uh, outcomes change, um, I, I, um, I just want to talk about one. So in economic history, there's been a number of, of exciting papers on this. One I'm particularly fond of is a paper by Agar Bustan and Erickson, where basically they use the historical context of the abolition of slavery in the U.S. South as a shock to the wealth of white Southerners. So basically, because slavery was abolished, these people who had a lot of their wealth in slaves just had this really negative wealth shock. Um, and so what they do is compare households that are, are kind of equally wealthy in the 1860, um, but one had more in, of their wealth in slaves and the other didn't. And so in 1870, just 10 years later, one had become much less wealthy than the other. And what they find is that that wasn't transmitted to the next generation. So really these sons rebounded pretty quickly um, in terms of uh, uh, economic status in the next generation. Um, and even by the grandchildren had surpassed that. And so they argue that this suggests that really it's something else that's going on, that, like social networks that are important, that it's really not about the wealth. Um, and so there are other papers that looked at shocks due to lotteries, um, winning a lottery, um, random land lotteries in the in historical context, um, housing appreciation, and if you become wealthier because your house appreciates, how does that affect your kids? Um, so there's a lot of really interesting, I think, and exciting work in that area right now. So finally, I want to just take a step back and talk about um, the project that I'm working on now, which is basically started with all this other work that we were doing and really thinks about what do we mean when we think about wealth and wealth inequality. So wealth is actually kind of a messy measure um, because it's a stock and it's the result of not just accumulation of assets, but also spending of assets. Um, and so individuals could have similar wealth but different sources of income, for example. So it could be that I inherited all my money and you worked and inherited none of your money. And at a point in time, we have the same wealth. Or it could be that we have the same sources of wealth, but I spend a lot and you save a lot. And so we have different wealth. And so to understand wealth and wealth inequality, I think we really need to think about what we want to measure. And so just to give the extreme example, if we had two households where one household had very little labor income, but a large inheritance from parents and resulting capital gains, um, and the other household had no inheritance, but worked hard and saved their labor income, and we saw at age 65, they had the same wealth, would we want to say that this was a very equal society? Or similarly, if two people had the same income, but one spent a lot and the other saved, and at age 65, they had very different levels of wealth, would we wanna say that that was a very unequal society? And so it really kind of forces you to think about what is it that we wanna be measuring? And so in this project that I'm currently working on with uh, Paul Devereaux, Fanny Lando, and Chel Salvanis, we kind of think about this using some data from Norway. And so what we do is use administrative data and calculate what we call our, a measure of lifetime resources, um, which is basically just the inflow of income into the household over the lifetime. And unfortunately, we don't observe over the lifetime, but we can observe over 20 years. And so we follow kind of how much you've taken in and, and don't, you know, don't take out the consumption. And so when we do that, we have this measure that we call lifetime resources, and we can compare it to net wealth which is what we would normally measure and see how does how do the two compare? Are they highly correlated? And then we can look at what the most important sources of income are over the life cycle. So where are people getting uh, their more money and how does it vary across the wealth distribution? So where are rich people getting their money from and where, where are the poor people getting their money from? And then the last thing that we do is think about what's a better predictor of children's outcomes. So if that's what we care about, you know, what out, what measure is more important? And so, as I said, what we're going to do is use a comprehensive data set from Norway on wealth and income over the life cycle, ideally over the life cycle, but really we have 19 or 20 years. And I said we calculate this measure of lifetime resources in 2013, which is really the sum of all income inflows from 1995 to 2013, plus your baseline wealth in 1994. So basically just all the money that's come into the household. Um, 
And then, as I said, we just look at the correlation between this and net wealth, and then look at this measure, the measure of uh, the sources of, of income and how they vary across the wealth distribution. So there's obviously a lot of literature on this, and in the interest of time, I'm not really going to talk about any of it. Um, people have really focused on individual components. Um, and so what we're going to do is really just do a big picture. And so it's a super simple paper where we're really just adding up and then calculating fractions. So there's no um, macro model. So there's a large macro literature that kind of tries to map components into the wealth distribution. We're really just creating this lifetime resources measure and looking at it and saying, what does it look like and how does it relate to other things that we measure like net wealth? Uh, uh, in our data sets. Um, so we spend a lot of time in the paper talking about the fact that we're using data from Norway. So again, um, it's not that we think Norway is, you know, the perfect country to study, but it happens to be because it has this great data. Um, and so uh, in the paper, we have a lot of time and here. I don't have as much time. So just to give you a flavor of what we do, uh, we compare Norway's distribution of wealth to other countries, uh, other European countries in particular. Um, and what we see is it's, it's quite similar. So just to give you some brief uh, distributional measures, uh, if you look at the median net wealth, and this is comparing survey data for the other countries and the Norwegian administrative data. So it's not a one, you know, apples to apples comparison, but unfortunately the survey does not uh, survey Norway, so we can only uh, use the administrative data. And what we see in terms of median net wealth is Norway looks quite similar to other countries. In terms of the Gini coefficient in net wealth, they look quite similar. And so in a, a, along a number of other metrics, they look quite similar. Um, just to be fair, when we look at the World Inequality Database, uh, which is a different data set that um, uses aggregate data, um, not survey data, uh, we see that Norway actually has, when we look at the wealth to income ratio, which says kind of how important is something like inheritance likely to be, um, Norway ranks relatively low, um, similar to the US. Um, and so, you know, depending on what data set you use, you can kind of draw different conclusions, but we're pretty open and try to show you that I think Norway at least is a reasonable country to look at. Um, there's a wealth tax in Norway, uh, which is why we have such great data. So um, we're very grateful for it. Uh, it's around 1% during our sample period above a threshold. Um, the threshold was about 1.5 million Norwegian kroner for a married couple, um, which is if you divide by 10 to get it into dollars, US dollars. Um, I don't have other conversions, but uh, that gives you a sense of what that looks like. It's a pretty high uh, deduction. Um, there's also an inheritance and gift tax. Um, and so we also have excellent data on inheritance and gifts. And uh, there's a very compressed income distribution in Norway and a strong welfare state. So it was kind of surprising to us how spread the wealth distribution was given how, how compressed the income distribution is. And so, as I said, we're just creating this measure of lifetime resources in 2013, where we take your net wealth in the beginning of our period, and we just add in all the money that you're taking in over time. So through labor earnings, capital income, government transfers, inheritance and gifts, lottery wins, the appreciation of real assets, the appreciation of financial assets and subtract off the wealth tax. And so that really is, it's just an, a simple accounting exercise to see where are people getting their money from. Um, so uh, I'm not going to spend much time talking about the data. There is a draft of a paper, it's an MVR working paper, so I, we're, we're completely redoing it and hopefully there will be new papers in the next month. But in the meantime, if you're interested, um, the data sources haven't changed. And so, um, we're using this population data and this really excellent wealth register data. And we're going to focus on people who age from between 21 to 46 in 1994 to 40 to 65 in 2013. Though uh, we can look at longer, we think this is really an important time for wealth accumulation. 
Um, and then the last thing that we do is define this individual household wealth. So we don't want to follow just the individual because once you get married, you know, you're sharing your wealth. So we create this hybrid where when you're single, you get whatever comes into your household um, all to yourself. When you're married, you get half of what comes into the household. So um, if one spouse earns more than the others in labor income, we add and divide by two. Um, and so we have a lot of uh, different variables. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them because I have about two more minutes and I want to show you what we find, but, uh, but I'm happy to talk about that offline. Um, just to give you an idea of what the distributions look like, this is net wealth in 2013, which we've seen lots of pictures of, and you see a big spike at zero. This is lifetime resources, not surprisingly, because we're not letting people consume to some extent. It shifted much to the right um, and, and uh, uh, kind of a little fatter in the middle. Um, when we look at the correlation between lifetime resources and net wealth, uh, we see it, it, it ends up being about 0.77 when we Windsorize the top and bottom 0.1% of each distribution. The correlation is very sensitive to, to how we treat these extreme values. So what we do is then look at the, the ranking and the rank correlation. So this is the uh, rank of lifetime resources and the rank of net wealth. And you can see that at the top, it's very highly correlated. At the bottom, it's also more correlated. In the middle, it's just a lot flatter. So there's just a, not nearly as much correlation in the middle of the distribution. Um, and so what we show in the paper, well, in the new paper, not the old one, is that measures of inequality are going to be very sensitive to which metric you use. So um, uh, the Gini coefficient for net wealth is 0.59. Um, while it's 0.27 for lifetime resources, um, the share of resources held by the top 1% is about 0.17 for net wealth and only 0.07 for lifetime resources, so it looks much more equal. Um, but if you start adjusting for like a certain minimum amount of consumption, um, we see that those metrics also change. And so it suggests that inequality, you know, measures of inequality really have to be thoughtful about what you're, what you're measuring. And so just to show you, when we look across the distribution, so this is uh, the percentiles for the lifetime resources distribution, and we've kind of focused, zoomed in more at the top because we think there's a lot more going on than at the bottom. This is the share, so these all add up to one. This is the share of lifetime resources, to, you know, uh, attributed to each component. And so this big purple is labor income. So for most people, labor income is the largest share component of their lifetime resources. And it only changes when you start getting to the very top 1%. Um, in contrast to so this is government transfers, you can see they become small very quickly. This light yellow is like, is housing wealth. Um, this is uh, financial, risky financial assets, which are really only important uh, returns on risky financial assets are only important for the very top of the distribution. And what was interesting to us is this tiny little kind of greenish line bar, that's the share due to inheritances. And so <laughs> what, we, what we find is inheritances are a really small part, um, even for the very top of the distribution. And so right now we've kind of split that into another paper where we spend a lot more time kind of digging into that and showing that no matter how we cut it, that really seems to be true. And so we see the same pattern. So we had broken it by decile of lifetime resources, but you see the exact same pattern when you break it by net wealth, which is a, a, something we would actually be able to observe in our data. So often we can't observe lifetime resources. And as Professor I said, Black. we spend, Professor, yeah. you, you want to wrap it up in like two or three yes. minutes? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got it. We're good. So inheritances are, we're almost done. Um, we spend a lot of time, and that's why we've made it into a separate paper, kind of digging into the inheritances. But really, uh, almost no matter how you cut the data and how, how you fix the denominator, um, inheritances just aren't that important for most people, even the very wealthy. And so it's not true that it's not important for anyone. It's just for most people, it's really not important. And then the last thing that we look at 
is predictive ability and just because that's kind of where we started our research, thinking about children's outcomes and, and well, the role of wealth. And so the question in our mind was, you know, do you really want wealth or do you want lifetime resources uh, for when you're thinking about kids' outcomes? And so we try to predict uh, these different outcomes, uh, basically whatever we had. And what we find is that lifetime resources seems to be a better predictor of children's outcomes than net wealth. And um, labor income is also better, much better than net wealth and similar to lifetime resources. And so to conclude, uh, in the last 15 years, I think we've made a lot of progress in terms of understanding wealth inequality and in particular this intergenerational persistence. There's been a lot of great new data um, to measure it and some really innovative studies trying to get at the causal mechanisms. And um, the last thing that we did was thinking about, you know, that wealth is a really messy measure uh, and need, you need to be thoughtful about what you mean by wealth. And that was it. <laughs> so how should I? Okay. So how should I best answer questions? I see there's hands up. I can't see anything with this. Let's see. I don't know how to stop sharing. I don't know how to stop sharing. Hmm. Um, okay, I guess I'll just look at questions here. I don't know how to, how to so I can't see any hands because I can't see anyone. Um, but uh, so we did, how does capital gains of risky assets predict children's outcomes? Not very, not very well. None of the individual components except labor income actually predict very well. Um, uh, so housing can, so in terms of housing, whether it's considered wealth or consumption, we actually calculate the imputed rental value. And so we're trying to kind of get rid of the consumption part of it. Um, and so it should be counted in there and it should be considered part of the intergenerate to the extent that housing is passed across generations, that would be part of an inheritance. So that would be valued as an inheritance. Um, uh, in terms of whether children get to know and meet their biological parents, we don't actually know that. It seems unlikely, um, but if anything, that would mean the biological parents are more likely to have a bigger effect, and we're kind of finding that they have much less of an effect, so it seems like that would be um, uh, biasing us in the wrong way. Um, in terms of why schooling is more related to nature, I think people use kind of the idea that ability is more important for educational attainment and other things like, you know, networks and things like that might be more important for, uh, for things like wealth and asset allocation and things like that. Um, uh, is the wealth of bio, so someone can stop me when I have to stop. Off. Is the wealth of biological parents correlated with that of adoptive parents? They are very small. It's 0.07, and we try to kind of show that even if they are correlated at 0.07, it's unlikely to be biasing our results very much at all. Um, uh, then the wealth tax doesn't seem uh, to do very much. Yeah. The wealth tax isn't really doing very much in terms of uh, inequality. Um, it could do more, though. Um, I think I've answered all the questions that are here. Hello? Anyone still there? Hello? Hi. I'm um, sorry, I got muted. Is there oh, any other okay. questions there? <laughs> Sorry, I figured out how to stop. I don't know where my video went either. There. Yeah, yeah. New can technology. I, can, I, can, can, I, can I ask one question? Yeah. Like, when yeah. you, you talk about like inheritance tax is not that important, but we know that sometimes we call inheritance tax like a sudden death tax. Like, if I'm very rich. I, I've tried to, you know, spread out all my giving to my children, like when I was like in, in 10 or 20 a year's time of time. Right. I'm not sure what what's happening in in Norway. That do you think? So this... you're you're actually taxed on gifts as well, and so 40% of the gifts and inheritances we see are actually in the form of gifts. So you can't you can't oh, okay. give away your wealth 
before you die and not get taxed on it. I mean, you certainly could like if you did small amounts, um, but uh, but if you if you tried to give like big amounts, you would you would be caught and taxed on it. So um, so you, you can't really avoid it that well. You can avoid it somewhat, I don't, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have one more minute. Uh, any other questions? I hope I didn't speak too fast. <laughs> I tend to talk fine. more it's quickly. It's great. More quickly when I'm running out of time. So. Okay, so uh, well, thank it's you uh, nine forty-five now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will end thank our you. session here. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>